Hello everyone, welcome back to Deska Discusses. Today I'm going to begin my epic, epic reviews on all the Star Wars films and all spin-offs. I think since the new trailer came out, it's given me, well, given me that feeling like, yep, I think we're ready for it. They're ready, we're, we're ready, and you guys are ready for all the reviews from episodes one, all through to eight, plus Solo and Rogue One. I'm gonna review all of them. So this one today is going to be Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace. Let's do this. Now before we get into the first review on The Phantom Menace, let's just talk about my love for Star Wars. Now, obviously growing up, Star Wars was a huge and integral part of my childhood. Star Wars did it does hold a special part in my life. Now, I remember watching the old VHS um, film, the, the old VHS versions of Star Wars back in the day. They were taped off TV here in Australia. And I grew up watching the original versions. That's what I mean is that like without the special editions. Now, I remember the special editions came out and it was all exciting and I bought the uh, VHS pack, the gold one back in the day and I was like, wow, look at this, all the extra stuff they've got on it. We'll talk about that another time. Star Wars, you know, today for me, that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to the rise of Skywalker. Now everyone's all about Marvel and Endgame and all that. I'll talk about why I'm not as pumped for that. But I think the main thing is that Star Wars is very big for me. My favorite film of all time is Empire Strikes Back. Now let's talk about episode one. Now let's talk about episode one itself. It was in 1999. I remember going opening night with my dad and, you know, pretty pumped. I mean, you got how many years and years of watching the old ones and being a fan of the old ones all the time, re-watching and re-watching and re-watching the old ones, playing with all the figurines, even some of the video games as well. Then when you had the first trailer, you know, for episode one that dropped, I remember it vividly, it had every generation has a legend. And what's interesting is that the rise of Skywalker says the same kind of, well, has the same title in it, which is very, very interesting, I must say. In terms of when I watched that trailer, I remember back then, you know, the internet was just, you know, starting, oh, not starting off, but I watched it on E! News on pay TV here in Australia, or cable as they call it in America, and I taped it and I re-watched it over and over, and I thought, I thought it looked amazing. I thought the way it was edited, it didn't show us too much, but it was just, Amazing, I was actually watching something new and it looked amazing. You had this weird figure with like, you know, horns and a red face. You could see, I think it was, you know, Obi-Wan. You had a little kid um, who would obviously be Anakin Skywalker. It was just, it was quite all over the place when you think about it now when I rewatched that trailer. But for back then, it got everyone pumped. It was, I think, the most anticipated film of all time up until that point. Now, now you've got all these other films that are coming out, but we've got to remember guys, the late 90s, a Star Wars film had been so many years since Return of the Jedi was released. What was George Lucas going to do with this episode one? We were all holding our breaths, waiting for this epic, epic Star Wars episode one, the Phantom Menace film to come out. And then I watched it that night. And this is where my review begins. Now, in terms of the storyline of episode one, we follow, well, where can we start with episode one? We follow two Jedis who basically go into this ship and it's all about what well, you're given this the, the the opening crawl is about trade federations and um trade routes and and all this jargon that i remember the first time i watched it i'm like okay i'm kind of getting what's going on here the problem i'm not gonna talk about the problems with episode one yet let's just go through that storyline you know you you met obi-wan kenobi you met qui-gon jinn you're thrown into this kind of like circumstance or this situation where they need to escape from these we don't even know what they are they're bad guys are they good guys the trade federation and they get off and then they end up going to a planet and they meet jar jar binks and then there's more political talk and then from that they end up leaving this blockade and then they end up on tatooine and they meet a little kid and they've got to fix their ship and the little kid is anakin skywalker basically the storyline for me at the time watching it it was rather confusing but before we get into that before we get to the nitty gritty of it let's look at a few other things so one cinematography in terms of how George Lucas filmed this and how it all looks to me, I really like the throwbacks and how they went into, I think it was, yeah, they went to Tunisia and they filmed a lot of scenes in Tatooine, which made it look amazing, you know? It was like, okay, cool, George Lucas has gone with this. We've gone into Tatooine, we've gone into Tunisia. He's actually used the original, well, some of the original locations where he's at, and you can feel the set, it's, it, feel the set sorry. 
it's tangible, you're there. A lot of the sets and a lot of the cinematography in this is rather good. Now, the camera work works fine, right? Now, yeah, I'm gonna mix your cinematography with visual effects. The problem we have in the film is that, well, the late 90s relied a lot on visual effects and George Lucas was a big fan of it and he basically, whatever he thought into his head, he goes, yes, I can put it on the screen. Now, if you've seen the behind the scenes making of episode one, you'll know what I mean. We've got a lot of sets that were created there's more than you think of. You probably think episode one, two, three, oh, it's all green screen, but no, he did create a lot of sets. However, the ones that he used look great and Tunisia shots are fantastic. Some of the establishing shots are great. However, when you mix that with visual effects, it does turn into a bit of a mess. It turns into a giant green screen visual effects mess. Now, I'm not gonna go on about the pod race and all that, but it's not just the pod races. I think it's the whole fact that the Trade Federation robots that you know, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon fight, they're digital, okay, and they chop through them like butter, as George Lucas says in his making of. It kind of makes the film, again, feel fake compared to the, the Stormtroopers in the original trilogy. Now, it's not to say that he did do something different and went with, like, you know, these robots, but one part of the digital is the whole enemy being robots, right? That That's what kind of annoyed me a little bit. Now, moving on from that, Things like the pod race, although it looks visually amazing, what is it, 12, 13 minutes of just this giant race. Now, it looks great, but does it fit in well? The camera work in that is great. It feels like you're actually racing around, but to a certain point, it does get a bit tedious and boring. I think the problem I have with episode one, the, the thing about the way the camera works and the way the visual effects work and the editing, is definitely seen in the last fight between the Gungans and the Trade Federation, right? That whole sequence looks straight out of a video game and I remember vividly watching it at the movies, at the cinema for the first time and thinking, this does not look like, I mean, you know, if you think about it, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi had these battle sequences. Yes, you had Ewoks versus Stormtroopers, but it felt real. You're on Endor, you're in the forest, they're throwing things, things are blowing up, there's actual fire, there's explosions, right? Whereas with that, it just looked like a video game and it took me out of the movie and it still does to this day. Now, spaceship wise, in terms of visual effects, they all look great. If anything, they look too polished, okay? You had, I'm not gonna keep comparing to the old ones, but everything looks too polished in episode one. Now, remember 1999, like I was saying before, the visual effects, you know, that George Lucas had, you know, was for its time amazing and we all thought it looked great but it did take everything away from the storyline, which leads me to the next point, the storyline. Now, the storyline of episode one, well, look, as a 15, 16 year old teenager back then, I could follow it to a certain extent. Now the opening blurb for like a little kid reading it about trade federations and tax routes and it kind of is confusing. Now, even for me watching it now, you can point out a lot of plot holes and and gaps in the story. Now it's really interesting how they've got Darth Sidious in there as well, you know, Emperor Palpatine, uh, the Palpatine, Senator Palpatine playing those two key roles, okay? But the whole thing about her, the Queen Amidala signing the treaty, then you've got the Jedi's down there, the Gungans, there is no clear protagonist in this. I mean, we've met Anakin Skywalker, we know who he's gonna become as well. It's kind of like a subplot to the film. Now he ends up getting into the ship and destroying the main ship of the Trade Federation, which again, I found a bit ridiculous at the time, and I still do. So I'm just saying that the storyline in this is quite jagged. Now, if you've seen the making of Star Wars Episode One, you'll notice that George Lucas actually says that as well, that he went too far in some certain points, and I definitely agree. Rewatching it now, you can see the major issues they had. The problem was is that the film starts off in really kind of like throws you into this action sequence where it's kind of like we don't actually know what's at stake and how we're actually viewing what we're actually viewing. Now what I mean by that is that what's going on? We're kind of told but through different scenes and through different characters and then we're thrown onto another planet and then all of a sudden you meet Jar Jar Binks. We're we'll going to well yeah we will get into Jar Jar Binks. Now I really feel sorry for the actor who played him who suffered a lot of bullying and harassment over the years on the internet after he played Jar Jar Binks. I don't blame his role in the film, like him playing the character. He was given the script, he was given the brief on to how to play the character. I don't hate the actor himself at all. I really don't. 
it was the script and it was the way that went about introducing this. When you've got all these key things with trade federations and tax routes happening and you've got this slapstick character in there saying these silly lines and, and you know, stepping on poop and sticking at his tongue, then obviously you can end up really being annoyed with a certain type of character because he's getting the, in the way of things and trying to make cheap gags for the older members of the audience. For the younger members, I'm sure it was fantastic. Now remember the old ones, you probably had C-3PO was the bumbling psychic and R2 as well. All right, Jedi had its Ewoks and they were there for the kids too, but with Jar Jar Binks, the whole hatred behind him, I can understand that, but remember, there's no point hating the actor who played him and putting him through hell. It was bad directing in my book and it was bad writing. In the storyline, you know, we, we find Darth Sidious, he's got a uh, apprentice who's Darth Maul. Now, the thing is with Darth Maul, was that it was a great villain, the way he looked, you know, the double-edged lightsaber, you know, last we'll get our revenge. However, that's literally probably, what, one of two lines or the only major line of dialogue he has. He was grossly underused in this film and he could have been, he could have been an epic, epic villain. He looked the part, he had the great lightsaber, he had all the weaponry and everything, he had that, he had that look about him, but he wasn't used much at all, which is another problem with the film having a proper antagonist. The antagonist was Darth Sidious, the guy in the hologram, you know, who ends up, we know later on, being, you know, Senator Palpatine as well. But having Darth Maul there, having, what, two fight sequences with one with Qui-Gon and then one at the end with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan Kenobi, he was grossly underused. I always felt that the scene where the, uh, those, those shutters, the security shutters are shutting down and, like, he's waiting behind the, be the, the laser wall, or whatever it is, and Qui-Gon's sitting there meditating, I would have thought when he's pacing up and down, I remember vividly in the movie saying, please say something cool, say something, but he doesn't. I think that would have been an epic moment for him to just have some sort of dialogue with Qui-Gon, but hey, that's me. And the acting from Liam Neeson was okay with Qui-Gon. Ewan McGregor did a good job too, as the two Jedi. I think that Ewan McGregor did, an, uh, did a better job than Liam Neeson. I think Liam Neeson's role was, wasn't as fleshed out as it should have been. Um, Ewan McGregor played a good young Obi-Wan Kenobi and it, it's paid off in episode, maybe not episode 2, but episode 3 definitely and hopefully they'll make an Obi-Wan film down the track. Now Yoda, I remember the original version I saw was the puppet, obviously now they've done the CG version, the CG version looks a lot better I must say. Jake Lloyd, again, copped up a lot of flack for being a little kid playing Anakin Skywalker from all the fans and fanboys of Star Wars, he copped a lot for being just a kid playing Anakin Skywalker. How did you expect him to play it? Alright, a lot of people say maybe he should have played the role a bit darker. Again, that all stems from the writing of George Lucas and everyone around him. Maybe there was too many yes people around George Lucas telling him that everything was fine and it's fantastic and it's going to be amazing. Again, proof of that is in the making of Star Wars Episode 1. But to have a go at Jake Lloyd for being a bad actor and playing it really bad, I don't, I don't blame him at all. He was a little kid, he was given direction, that's what he got given to him. Natalie Portman did a great job playing Queen Amidala and Padme as well. Again, being a younger actress back then, and you can see her in episode two and episode three definitely maturing, and to see what she's done now, at least she didn't fall for that curse of being just typecast into just Star Wars films, as previous actors and actresses were, right? Now going back to the storyline just real quickly, as it keeps going, it just feels like the film's got action sequence, dialogue about something, another action sequence, introduction to a new character, political talk, action sequence, more political talk, action sequence, humorous, ha ha ha, funny stuff, more political talk, meet another new character, pod race, which goes on forever, then more political jargon, trade federation garbage that, again, just puts the viewer to sleep. And that's the problem with The Phantom Menace was that I do give George Lucas some points for trying to be different, okay? Meaning that he tried to do something different with the storyline, but I think the way they went about it in terms of going down this Trade Federation path, I know it kind of links well to episode two and three. It's just that at the time when you're really pumped for a new Star Wars film and you're given this whole exposition of like, you know, being in the Senate and, and Trade Federations and treaties and who's not signing the treaty and wipe them out, all of them, and then battles and robots and Gungans and who's fighting for who and pod races and 
Anakin Skywalker, you're sitting there watching all this Trade Federation stuff and political stuff, and then you, you've got Anakin Skywalker as a kid there, and you're like, wow, that's gonna be Darth Vader. Show me more of that. Why, why is he so special? Well, he can race pod race, he can race pods. That's why he's special, apparently. And then you're given the whole thing about midichlorians. He's got a high midichlorian count. Now, I remember vividly seeing that sequence of Liam, uh, Qui-Gon Jinn talking to Anakin about what are midichlorians, that they live inside you and we're receptors to them and blah, blah, blah. And I remember as a young, as a teenager thinking, are they actually doing this? Are they actually explaining what the Force is and why Anakin is so special? That whole sequence there, that they don't really mention further on down the track in the films, spoiled that whole lore of the Force. And you probably think, oh, it's no big deal. Well, to me it was. And we're given so much info and so much information about what's happening in the storyline and told exactly what's happening and then to be told, hey, this is what the Force does, it's kind of like a kick in the guts for the audience as well and fans of Star Wars. So the good points for me for The Phantom Menace, after re-watching it many times over the years, now it's been a long time, obviously it's been 20 years since it came out. The good points are that obviously some of the set design was actually filmed on location, which was great. Okay, so that was, oh, I give it that, a bit of a tick for that. Two, George Lucas went for something a little bit different. Now you're probably thinking I'm contradicting myself because I said I hated the whole Trade Federation and political jargon stuff. Well, I will commend George Lucas for going for something a little bit different, just a tiny bit, okay? Three, Anakin's backstory was okay. There were some good parts of it as well. I mean, I'm talking about minuscule parts. Now there was, there was a deleted scene where they show Anakin getting angry and um, fighting someone else, a little kid or a little creature or something like that. I think they should have left that in. If you want to check it out, check it out on the internet or on the DVD as well, which was pretty cool. My other good point of it would be, look, the lightsaber sequence with Darth, uh, Darth Vader, Darth Maul, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, although it seemed extremely choreographed, it was a pretty cool light, lightsaber fight. Again, it does look really choreographed and I felt, watch, I feel, at, oh, I felt at the time watching it like, wow, this is so cool. Double-edged lightsaber, Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan, they're fighting this guy, it's pretty epic. There's no dialogue between them, which does give it some, well, I don't think, it, I think they should have had some dialogue into this fight sequence. It doesn't give it more emotion, it doesn't give it any emotion at all like the previous films. The other point to the fight sequence is Jewel of the Fates, the soundtrack from John Williams. I think the episode one soundtrack really did well with the Trade Federation theme, Jewel of the Fates. They're up there with some great, great themes of the film. So I think the soundtrack is one of the stronger points of The Phantom Menace and Jewel of the Fates goes down as, as soon as you hear it, you know it's Star Wars. The soundtrack, some of the cinematography on locations, the lightsaber fight was really cool as well. Anakin's backstory to an extent, everything else, they're, well, they're my good points. The bad points that I want to talk about, well, I've been through it and I'm not going to repeat myself. A jagged storyline, way too much stuff, uh, too, too many things happening and too much info given to the audience at too quick of intervals. There's no chance to just stop and take a break apart from a 12 minute pod race or however long it is, okay? Other bad points are that cut out the midichlorian stuff and just, you know, show him doing something Jedi-esque, as they say. Another bad point is the use of digital effects. Now, I did go on about that before, I'm not gonna go on again about it, but at times it was like it was a video game and it just felt fake. So in summing up, in terms of episode one, right? What happened was I watched it the one time, I remember walking out and I remember thinking in my head, I'm like, wow, I really didn't enjoy that at all, okay? But what I would go and tell my friends and family after that and cousins and friends over the weeks to come, I'd be like, oh, it was so cool. It was, I was trying to convince myself that it, was, that it was good. I even went to extra screenings. I remember they had on Saturday mornings, they had like $8 tickets. So I used to catch a bus and go watch it. I was trying to, I saw it maybe two, three, four times at the cinemas, trying to convince myself that it was good. And well, it was an older brother who just, when he saw it, he just basically said to me, you know what? it's actually not that good. 
So maybe you just need to face the facts that it wasn't that good. And then I remember it came out on VHS and I bought it and I rewatched it. And again, I was disappointed. It was disappointing because you're waiting so long for this Star Wars film that, you know, I was born around the time Jedi came out. So later on, and you know, when I was six, seven years old, finally watching these Star Wars films on tape that my parents had as well and falling in love with them and all the toys that I had. And then in 1999, being, you know, 16, 17 years old, rocking up, sitting there, the opening crawl comes down and then you're given this by George Lucas after so long. I can only imagine other older fans, how they felt. But for me, it was not good. It wasn't. So my final verdict after many years of re-watching, and I know that some friends of mine are going to watch this review and, and think, you know, we're going to have a big debate about which one's worth, episode, uh, which one's worse, episode one or two. I'll leave my episode two review for another time. But for episode one, I've pulled out all my good points. I've told you all the bad points that I believe in. And in the end, I would give The Phantom Menace a six out of 10. Now at the time, when I watched it, I'll probably give it a five out of 10, but after re-watching it and re-watching the other prequels and all the other films, where it stands, it's probably a six out of 10 for me. I'm not gonna go into comparing them with the other films yet, guys. I'm gonna talk about each film in the next few months or so. You know, you'll be seeing reviews of all the Star Wars films and we'll talk about them as a whole right at the end. But for now, six out of 10 for me for The Phantom Menace. I hope you enjoyed this review and analysis and what I thought of The Phantom Menace as well. And as always, guys, if you like this video, please leave a like, leave a comment. I wanna see what you guys thought of The Phantom Menace and whether or not you agreed or disagreed with what I said. Let me know what your favorite parts and least favorite parts of the film were and what, would you, what you would give it out of 10 as well in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video guys, please, if you haven't subscribed already, please hit subscribe, tap the notification bell, and if you wanna keep, up, keep updated with my, with my videos, please do that. And I'll see you guys on the next episode of Daska Discusses. Boom.